welcome you to uh, this amazing keynote, Are Robots the Future of Testing? That's kind of a big question a lot of us have. Uh, and who better than Jason Huggins himself to uh, present it? Uh, again, Jason doesn't really need an introduction, but uh, Jason was the original creator of Selenium. He's been deeply involved with Appium and many other projects. Uh, and we are glad that he could join us today from uh, Chicago uh, you know, to be with us. Excellent. So, so it's just uh, uh, us and then uh, a thousand of our friends here. Huh? Yeah, I see a bunch of them going up. So that's great. Okay, great. Yeah, so if you're connected, so I went through the training here um, the other day. Yes, yes. So okay, if you can hear me and you're connected, yeah, thumbs up. Okay, actually, I'm curious, just, just for, uh, for audience participation. Okay, now I want to see that side of the room. Everyone thumbs down. Just, I just want to see that. Is that is the fun, is a thumbs or is there a thumbs down button? We don't have a thumbs down. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Then I can't do some very impromptu uh, voting. We'll have to do it in the discussion. Okay, I think that's enough enough thumbs up though, so um, we can start with the show here. Um, so I should just go for it, huh? Absolutely. Take all it right. away. Great. All right. So I'm going to start my clock here, so I don't use up uh, all your time. I can do five minute talks, I can do an hour long talk, or I can talk for 10 hours uh, about all this stuff, but I'll respect your time here. So I'm officially started. Um, I will, this is my first virtual conference. So hello everybody. Uh, I'm Jason Huggins. I'm your uh, opening speaker today. And um, uh, it's gonna be a little bit chaotic to make sure I can kind of track the discussion and my slides and stay on time. So I will open the discussion tab. I can't promise that I'll be able to read that and answer questions and be able to get done in now 16 minutes, uh, but I will try to uh, look at that. Um, also, just to kind of maybe break the ice here, <clears throat> um, if we don't, can't, can't do thumbs up or thumbs down, maybe you can just answer in the chat. Um, so the question for, for the next 15 minutes, are robots the future of testing? What do you think? You can just answer yes or no in the discussion. While I uh, bring up my slides here. And I hope you can see my first slide. So no, yes, definitely not. Hello, Jason. It is yes, <laughs> yes and no. Okay, <laughs> at least I know there's a whole bunch of people watching, not fully. Right. So, um, so we'll see if we if we sway some of the votes um, at the end at the end of this talk. Okay, so I'll just get into it. So, are robots the future of testing? Uh, this is uh, me. Uh, I'm Hugs on Twitter. Uh, this is me in front of my. Uh, office in just west of uh, the city of Chicago in a town called Oak Park. Uh, this is me in a January. Um, and this is me uh, these days in uh, in August <laughs> 2020, right? So hopefully this isn't us for um, the next several years. But anyway, this is just me uh, walking back and forth uh, from the office. Um, I needed to update the slide for the presentation. Um, very, very quickly, I'm going to just rush through here, even though each one of these is a very long story. I started the project, the Selenium project, in 2004, so I can't believe here we are 16 years later. Um, and very much the project is is all of you who are attending, um, including Simon, who is the lead of the project right now. Um, I'm the keeper of the grand fire, uh, of, keeper of the campfire stories. Um, but uh, anyway, so I'm all glad. I'm very glad you're here. But uh, it takes it takes a, a lot of people to make that keep this project going, and it's all of you now. Um, so that was two thousand four, two thousand eight. Uh, I founded Sauce Labs. Um, again, I'm just going to keep going here. Uh, in twenty twelve, uh, started the Appium project, um, and in twenty fifteen, I uh, took my side project kind of hobby and formally incorporated as a C corporation, uh, Taps for Robotics. And anyway, so that's my brief bio. Um, all over those years, I, the way I would describe Selenium is that it was it's like a robot. And th this is the, actually the slide that I would use when I would talk to the press or investors or whoever. Because it's hard to vision, it's hard, it's hard unless you actually see Selenium automating a browser in real time. Uh, it's hard to kind of describe what it is. So I'd always say it's it's like a robot. Um, and after a while, after several years, I kind of wanted to test that metaphor, uh, and I call this the reverse Tron. If you've seen the movie Tron, you know these people got kind of trapped inside a computer. Reverse Tron is basically taking Selenium out of the computer into the real world and giving it arms and legs. Um, and hopefully it doesn't, you know, uh, become Skynet and take over the world, but, um, you know, hopefully it'll just stay uh, true to just tapping buttons on phones. Um, this is the most recent robot that, um, that we've 
uh, release. This is the Tapster 3, so several generations of different robots. Um, I'm hoping that these embedded videos work in the presentation. I did a run through first before this, and it looks like, looked like it did. Don't know, at the, I don't know if you can hear the audio. It's not so important. Uh, but this little demo is just sending hello world as a tweet. Did not uh, go to the next step and have it click the actual tweet button, but it, testing out the keyboard functionality. So that's that's kind of like the, the latest and greatest of the robots. Um, I can go into all the different kind of styles of the robots, but it's there's not enough time. Um, but I will say this was the first robot I made. This is the Bitbeam bot. A lot of things are different uh, here. The big thing is uh, way back when my robots were made out of laser cut wood. <laughs> um, it's also, um, you can see, I think there's even some, I, I laser cut these holes in a particular style to be la uh, Lego compatible. So there's a couple of Lego parts around here. Um, and I'll show you a video of this first robot. Um, the design goal really wasn't to you know, start a robotics company at the beginning. It was, it was just a, you know, almost like an art project. At the time in 2011, as you can see when I, when I made it, um, Angry Birds was really popular. Um, and uh, so here's a quick video. I apologize for the f blurriness of the video. I, I recorded this as like a backup to the live demo I was going to give to the, the conference presentation that I was, I was showing. I think this was recorded maybe 30 minutes before, um, way back when. Anyway, so um, that's the very, you know, very brief demo of my first robot. Um, one of uh, a friend saw this video and actually said like, hey, if you want to speed things up, you should try different robotics designs. Um, and so over the years, I've specifically tried different kinds of formats of robotics, specifically with the idea of like speeding things up, making it kind of a, just a better robot, more specifically a better Angry Birds robot uh, thing. Anyway, so this is the T-Bot. Uh, and there's a bunch of stuff going on here, but there's two circuit boards. Now there's one that's controlling this robot. If you're really into the, uh, the nerdy details, the geometry for this is a core XY as opposed to Cartesian. That was the one before. Um, and then there's another circuit board here. One of the things that I've added over time um, is these little servos um, to press the buttons. Also, just kind of a quick, um, just to check in, just make sure I'm not like speaking into the void here. Um, can, I, can, our thumb, uh, can I get some thumbs up just to make sure that the video is playing correctly for everybody? All right, great. <laughs> great. I imagine this is as awkward as, you know, anybody in TV or a YouTube streamer or, you know, it's just like, don't know uh, if I'm, uh, if my connection is dropped or anything, but so far so good. Um, so to the, to the heart of it though, are robots the future of testing? Um, I would say yes, um, but then I always have to kind of clarify it. Um, ro the way I understand robotics is that it, it's at the intersection of three circles, software, electronics, and mechanics. And so now all the way in, uh, you know, seven minutes into this talk, I wonder if some people joined this talk because they thought I was going to be talking about robotic process automation. And um, I'm not talking about that today. In fact, actually one, I hope there actually are RPA, robotic process automation talks at future Selenium conferences, if not this one. I, I, I apologize, I did not check the schedule. There also should be RPA vendors in the, in the booths. I think actually there's, there's plenty of overlap between Selenium and RPA uh, to the point where um, I've Googled like, what is the difference between RPA and Selenium? And the more stuff I read from RPA vendors saying, no, we're totally different than Selenium, the more I'm convinced there's absolutely no difference between Selenium and robotic process automation. Um, However, I would argue that, um, you know, they kind of blurred the word. I would always emphasize that Selenium was like a robot, but robots are robots. Like you need the mechanical and electronics. Um, so I'm just focused on actual robots today, not the RPA stuff. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what I mean by actual robots in testing. And, there, and it does relate to um, most of us, in set, I'm assuming, coming from a software background and software testing, you're not necessarily electronics or mechanical engineers on this talk. And so here is is where effectively this, these robots are an extension of your software testing job. And a couple of examples. So this one was a uh, long time ago. This is probably Tapster 1, uh, still made out of wood. Um, very quickly, a lot of stuff happened just right there. But um, the robot was intended to be have the phone there, but what these people did, they were working on testing the Nike fuel band. 
So I'll just freeze frame it here. And when they went back to the office, this was after a workshop that we had, um, they were trying to figure out how to do an end-to-end -end test for the Nike Fuel Bands. Basically, it's like a Fitbit that can kind of measure your, it's like a step counter. And so they had the app, they're trying to figure out how to do the whole end-to-end -end thing. And they put, they decided to put the wristband in the robot and shake the wristband. And that's how they can do the end-to-end -end test. And so you can kind of see at the beginning of the video, there's 891 steps, and then it goes up to 892. By the end of the test, it's up to 894. So that, that was really creative. That was one of those things I did not anticipate. I, I, I thought they had the robot to test the phone. Anyway, but that speaks to an example of when you have uh, a test scenario that requires the phone talking to something local to it, not a database in the cloud, but something of connected device, like a Bluetooth device or over Wi-Fi. So it could be a TV or your, your step counter, your watch, um, your toaster, something like that. Those kind of testing interactions. Um, you might have to, there's actually specific examples where um, this actually happens a lot where that device needs to get paired over Bluetooth to your phone and testing that scenario, specifically the engineers I talked to, they'll need to push new firmware to that fuel band or the watch or whatever. And uh, the test scenario that they'll need to do is not, it, sometimes it's, it, they have to power cycle the device. Um, so they have to literally hold down a button uh, and they need something for that. Or they want to test the interaction where uh, they also are turning on and off Bluetooth. And they want to test that whole like first registration process. Um, and the conversations we have is like the only thing they have to for that is uh, manual testing because they have to physically hit these buttons. So they're hoping to bring in robots to uh, fit, uh, hit those buttons. Um, and also there's another aspect of this is you could argue that robots are not the future of testing from the point of view. You can do a lot of stuff in simulators. But even if you have a simulator for the phone, you wouldn't necessarily have a simulator for your phone and your Bluetooth device and kind of a, a simulated world where both of those things can interact together, right? So at that point, you have to be in the real world and occasionally you have to have a little thing that presses these buttons. Um, there's some other scenarios. In this particular case, this is a robot that we made. The use case specifically was for getting to the bootloader screen of an Android phone. This robot's a little bit over-engineered for that task because it can do anything on the touch screen and it can do the side buttons. It was called Sidekick was the name of this one. Um, but a more refined version of this robot was this. We call this a PBR, a push button robot. All it, it's not really a robot. All it is is it has these little servos here for pressing uh, the buttons on the side. And so it's really subtle, but if you look right here, um, you can see like the actuator. I've got a very simple API, long press and release going to mute the audio here. Uh, and this really gets you to, it starts the phone. Occasionally, if you have a device lab, um, if you're a, uh, you know, a, a real device vendor um, and you have all these devices all racked up, occasionally you literally just have to press the button. Uh, all these phones that we have are not really designed to be servers. So if you had a server in a rack, you can turn these things on um, remotely, but phones weren't necessarily designed um, to be automated, to, to be turned on from the network. So occasionally the conversations are like, we literally need a little servo in there to uh, press the button. Anyway, so that was one of the things that we created. Um, this particular case, you could argue it's not a robot. This is something I showed off at the Appium conference last year in Bangalore. Um, I've got two things going on here. One little um, Arduino circuit board is talking to the Mac. That's my laptop. The other one is acting like a virtual mouse. So it's not a robot but is some, it's more than just purely software running in a simulator. Uh, and so this is a new, ver a new feature that, was, that came out in iOS 13 last year that iOS supported uh, USB keyboards. And so this little circuit board can act like a virtual uh, mouse or keyboard, which means you can have access to maybe automate iPhones in a different way. Um, so there's a certain argument of like, if you can expand your, your toolkit of skills beyond uh, purely software skills and maybe bring up you know, a little bit of electronics here, you, can, you have access to kind of automate things. You wouldn't be necessarily limited by what you can do through the USB cable or um, a th through a simulator. Uh, this is my favorite example of, you can maybe argue this is a robot, maybe not. Uh, people in robotics love to argue whether that some, that something is a robot or not. Um, I, there's a question here. I hope to get it back. To, I haven't been watching, but what will you use to assert button actions? Cameras? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, I'll come back to that. So the demos that I've shown you so far, um, no, the cameras have not been involved, but that's kind of a future thing to have a camera 
Well, maybe I'll answer now. Uh, you have a camera there to do computer vision and then close that loop uh, to do validation. But sometimes you can do validation by just getting the screens off of the through the USB cable. Anyway, that's a longer conversation. Uh, this is my favorite. This is one of my sorry. Going back to the presentation here. Um, this is one of my favorite test automation scenarios uh, it's from a company uh, design agency in, in Australia, I believe. And you have three point of sale systems here and then a charge card and they're testing various interactions. One, again, if you're setting up a point of sale system, sometimes you actually have to set up the, the discount rules literally on the device. Also, I think the way, if you read the blog post about this, um, they're testing the charge card with different scenarios with uh, sometimes the charge has you know, a negative balance or a positive balance or it's frozen or something like that. And so they, um, there's enough time, the train is going slowly enough so the software behind the scenes can reset before it tries the next test interaction. I thought this was like ridiculously creative. So you don't necessarily have to have a robot that looks like C-3PO or R2-D2 to do, to do kind of robotic testing. I thought this was interesting. Um, this is very much an abbreviated version of, of my uh, of other talks I've given, but you know, those are a couple of examples. Um, but I've been talking about this for like nine years now. <laughs> and so there's a certain argument of like, yes, uh, it is debatable on whether the ro robots are the future of testing. I would argue that if you're in those specific niches um, that need robots, then yes, the ro robots are the future of testing. But there's so much like, um, just if you look at the example of, uh, forget robots, but web uh, and Selenium, and then there's the mobile platform, which is huge. and would you necessarily need to learn all everything about mobile and Appium um, to do kinds of testing? Like there's so much still left to do in just web testing um, that you could spend your whole career only on web testing and not have to do anything with mobile. Same thing with even if you did web and mobile, uh, you might not find yourself, you know, dealing with these connected devices um, or doing things point of sale. So I think the better question then really is are robots the future of your testing to you as a person? Um, and I, I, the thing I want to really kind of, um, for people to take away from this is the answer is yes, if you want it to be right. So if, if you, um, I felt this way early in my career, I, I wasn't exactly kind of working on the things that I wanted to. Um, and for lots of different reasons, robots are just kind of fun. And so I, I made that true, <laughs> but else, but I also didn't really know, I always wanted to get in robots, but I didn't really know that there was a really good fit. I, I'm here to tell you that, that if you did want to play around with robots and kind of leverage all of your software testing skills, you can do that. There are companies, I guess one way to look at it is every product that is made, like physically made, they all, all those companies, they all have secret robot labs and they're employing robots and people with testing skills to kind of uh, do those things. It's kind of hard to find them. The kind of the way I accidentally found them is I made this robot and then they kind of came found, found me, but they are out there. Um, and I've only have like 20 seconds left here. So I'm just gonna briefly tell you how you could get started. You don't necessarily, I, this is not meant to be a, an infomercial for my stuff. So you can kind of get started just, you have to kind of believe that is possible and then kind of, you know, there's a couple of uh, next steps. So one, uh, you can pick up, I mentioned it very briefly, but didn't, it wasn't able to get into the details. And Arduino is a, this great platform that, that can be your bridge between your, your laptop and uh, controlling the environment um, around you. Uh, there's an upgraded version called the Raspberry Pi. And uh, beyond that, there's an integrated system. Like, you know, if you, I'm not going to jump back to it, but that slide of robotics where it's the electronics software and electronics and mechanical, sorry. Um, the Lego Mindstorms kind of has all that put together. And there's even uh, a, it's not officially Lego, but it's, it's a, it's a open source project called EV3. And oh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. Uh, this is the robot, the printer, printer bot, but the EV3 project, this is a, a particular robot that you can build. And this particular example is just drawing a dinosaur, but you could swap that out with a little stylus, put an iPad or a phone there, and you can kind of, you can build this yourself. Uh, so for a couple hundred bucks, um, you can put this together and start kind of getting into uh, testing with robotics. So really, you know, is it the future of all of our testing? Probably not, but can, is it the future of your testing? It can be if you want it to be. And, and I just want to plant that idea in your head. So, uh, two slides that I just didn't show. One other thing that would, it does help is having a little 3D printer. This one's really cheap, $150. And going back to this video, these little two parts right in here, those were 3D printed to hold the stylus. So if you have a Lego Mindstorms kit and a cheap 3D printer, you can pretty much do anything. 
So that was as quick as I could do it in 20 minutes. <laughs> so thank you. Um, there is my, uh, how you can kind of find me. Um, I'll see if I can answer some questions. And Naresh told me to, uh, if we can't get to the question and answers right now, I, I'll also be available this morning to hang out in the VIP booth to have uh, uh, more question and answers. So I, I hope that was uh, useful, uh, useful use of your time for the last 20 minutes. So thank you. All right. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I think we are a little running short of time. Uh, just want to keep the schedule. We got a little last, uh, late start. So I uh, do want to really thank you, Jason, for sharing your experience. I know it's a stretch to ask you to uh, compress all the stuff that you've been doing over nine years into a 20-minute session. Uh, but, you know, this is a great glimpse of uh, some of the potential that is there. So thanks again for sharing that.